back and to see you all again. Uh, although we read from Malachi this morning, we're going to look uh, at a couple of verses in Enoch. We will look at the, a couple of verses in Malachi as well. Um, but really, it's a couple of verses in, in Genesis chapter 5 I want to look at this morning, um, as well as other verses as well. But Genesis 5, let's read a couple of verses from there first of all. <clears throat> and let's just pray as well. Father, we want to thank you this morning that your word is living, it's active, it's sharper than a two-edged sword, and we want to pray that it would be sharp this morning, penetrating our hearts and our lives, encouraging us, equipping us, uh, and com uh, comforting us, Lord, and even correcting us where necessary. Lord, you know what we need to hear, and we just commit ourselves to you. Thank you for your word. Amen. Just going to look at, at Enoch. Um, again, we know he's famous for one thing, and we're going to look at that now this morning in verse 21 of chapter 5 of Genesis. Enoch lived 65 years and became the father of Methuselah. Don't fancy becoming a father at 65. Hard enough at 40. <laughs> uh, then Enoch walked with God 300 years, and he became the father of Methuselah, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 300 and 65 years, Enoch walked with God, and he was not, or he was no more, for God took him. Isn't that wonderful? Straight up into heaven, straight up into glory, not facing death. Only happened twice. Elijah was the other one. God took them to be with him. Uh, but the, th the, the interesting thing here about Enoch, and it mentions only about Enoch, of all this list of names, we have lots of these names <clears throat> of these men who lived vast lives, because obviously, initially, God didn't intend anybody to die. His intent was that we would live forever, but as soon as Adam and Eve sinned, of course, death came into the world. And isn't it remarkable? We, our scientists can tell us how we die, but they don't know why death is here. Well, they do if they read the Bible, of course. Death is here because of sin. Very clear link between the two. Um, but Enoch was the only one of all the long list who walked with God. The only one. But interesting, it says this. In verse 20, let's read verse 21 again. Enoch lived 65 years and became the father of Methuselah. Then Enoch walked with God. So actually, he didn't walk with God for the first 65 years of his life. It was only the birth of Methuselah, his son, that seemed to stir something in him. And that's so often the case, isn't it? When something happens in our lives, something gets a hold of us, wakes us up, triggers something within us, causes us to want to seek after God. And that seemed to what happened to Enoch here. And often the birth of a child can do that. When a child is born, particularly to, 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 to uh, uh, two parents who maybe had a bit of a, biblical, a, a Christian upbringing, and they recognize then that they need the help of God. They want to bring this child up in, in, a, in a dark world with something of God's light. And that can so often trigger something and change something. And that seemed to be what happened to Enoch here. It was then that he began to walk with God. Notice it doesn't say God walked with Enoch. So often we want that to be the case, don't we? We want God to walk with us. I want to go and do this, that, and everything. And God, come on, God, come with me and just bless me when I do it. It doesn't say that here. God, Enoch walked with God. Uh, and and uh, it's very different between, the, 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 between those two things, isn't it? God doesn't want just to walk with us. In fact, He won't do that. If we are intent on doing our own thing, then we can guarantee God is not going to come with us. You know, He's not going to just change His plans because I've decided that I want to do something else. Enoch walked with God. And that's the choice that we have as Christians today. We've just been singing about the Lord Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. God with us. He's with us today by His Holy Spirit. And He wants us to walk with Him. He wants us to walk with Him today. And uh, we have a choice to walk with Him or not. And there's a verse in Philippians 3, verse 18, which is a very salutary verse. It says that many walk... I'll read it to you. I'm not bother turning there. Um, get the right verse. 3, 18... Many walk of whom I often told you now as enemies of the cross of Christ. So we, if we walk as enemies of the cross of Christ, we cannot walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's impossible. The walk that we are to make is to be walking as friends of the cross. We are to be embracing the cross in our lives. That doesn't just mean that we get right with God about sin. It's far deeper than that. The ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ wasn't just once and for all there on the cross. Yes, it was in one sense, 
but there's a death to our own self that is ongoing. And the ministry of the cross, in a sense, being a friend of the cross, is embracing the death of self-life, the death of our own ideas, our own opinions, because they are barriers to walking with God. If I will elevate myself, my opinions, my thoughts, me, and all, uh, everything else about me, that is a barrier to walking with God. It gets right in the way, and it stops me walking with Him, and then Him fulfilling all those things in my life that He wants to do. And God's longing is that we walk so closely with Him in this day and never leave His side. We're living in days, aren't we, that are remarkable days. And I, I would say they're going to get more remarkable because we're nearing the end. We're nearing the end. Uh, and I, I think the Lord is dealing with us. Praise God. I don't think He's finished with us as a nation. He wouldn't have brought us out of Europe if He hadn't finished with us, if He'd finished with us. So I do believe the Lord is wanting to do something in our nation. And therefore, that's why He is shaking and he's wanting us as his people to walk closely with him in this day because God still has purposes for us even in this day. Well, I want to look briefly then, how, how are we to walk with God? What is God expecting of us? If we are going to walk with God and stay close to him, how is that going to happen? How did it happen for Enoch? And there are other names in Scripture where we read of people who walked with God. How do we do that? And I've got a few Scriptures to look at. Uh, the first one is in, in, in Micah 6, verse 8. I'll try and find it quickly. Micah 6, verse 8, and it says this. He has told you, O man, what is good. God has told them. And what does the Lord require of you? To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly. To walk humbly with your God. There's no greater barrier to walking with God than pride. It's the biggest barrier that there is. Pride is something God hates. In fact, the Bible give, tells us in James that God opposes the proud. God is actually opposed to us when we are uh, living in pride and elevating ourselves. It's a fearful thing. But you know what? When we start to humble ourselves and walk humbly, it, 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 it is if, it's as if it opens the, the, the windows of heaven are open for us because God gives grace to the humble. Isn't that wonderful? God gives grace to the humble so that we are able to walk with Him. We're able to fulfill His purposes. We can't do that without grace. Grace is not just a, a sort of a, a theoretical thing. Grace is real. It's the strengthening of God. It's the ability that God gives. It's something very, very real. And it so often actually comes through the Word. I read something, and it struck me for the first time. I've not seen this before. Um, you know, you do that sometimes, don't you? You read Scripture, and all of a sudden something hits you. You've not seen it before. And um, I've probably lost it now. It's uh, in Ephesians, and, and this thrilled me. Let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, but only such a word that is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give you grace. It will give grace, rather, to those who hear. Isn't that wonderful? You and I can speak to others, and God can use that to give grace to them, to give them encouragement, to give them strength in their spirits. So, friends, let's ensure that we're walking humbly with our God, because God will give us the grace that we need, and then you can even be used by God to speak to others and give grace to others. Grace doesn't exist in any other religion. The grace of God. It's wonderful. And it's what we need. If we're going to walk with God closely, we need His grace. We need His enabling. Particularly in the difficult times, we need to have His grace. And that word humbly in Micah can also mean circumspectly, carefully. You know, we don't walk in a sort of pally way with God. Oh, come on, we're going to walk. We, we walk circumspectly. This is the living God. This is the God who is to be feared above all gods. He's not like the gods of the world, of the nations. This is the living God, the God who deserves respect and reverence. Yes, we can get very close and, friend, and be friendly with our God, friendship with our God, but there needs to be a reverence as well, and we need to walk circumspectly with God. So when we walk with God, let's walk carefully. That doesn't mean we're afraid to draw near to God. That's not what it means. 
It means we walk circumspectly in reverence with him. He wants us to be close to him, but he also wants us to have reverence and have a fear of him. So there's the first thing, to walk humbly with our God. The second thing is found in another Old Testament book, in Amos. Go back a couple of books. Amos 3 and verse 3. I know it talks about two men here, but it says, Do two men walk together unless they have made an appointment or an agreement? About two men, I know. But in a sense, the same principle is when we walk with God. We cannot walk with God unless we are agreeing with Him. We need to agree with God. He, just, he doesn't have to agree with us. God is not going to agree with you or me. But we have to agree with God. We have to agree firstly that He's right about His verdict on our lives. That we are sinners deserving nothing. But the grace of God is poured out. His mercy is poured out upon us. We need to agree with God that His way for our lives is the right way. I need to set our hearts on following that way. We need to agree with God that He knows the right pace for the walk. He knows when we need to speed up a little bit and when we need to slow down a little bit. And as we get older, we think we need to slow down a bit, don't we? Well, the Lord knows. He knows what pace we are to be going at in our walk with Him, when we should be doing this or not doing that. The thing to do is to keep our eyes upon Him as we walk with Him. He sets the route for our life as well. He's the one that we need to walk with so that we fulfill every purpose for our life. If we do our own thing and go down our own path, we'll end up arriving at the end of our lives with very little to show for it spiritually. We may make it into heaven because of His grace and His mercy and we've been saved, but if we're not walking with Him, you see, a Christian can choose not to walk with God. If he does it in ignorance, and we can do that, we've all done it, we walk ignorantly, we make mistakes, and we do things, God is very gracious, he comes and gets us. Just like he went after that one lamb, there was 99, and one lamb went off. He, what did Jesus do? He said, the, shepherd goes, the good shepherd goes after that one lamb and brings him back on his shoulder. So often the Lord does that for us, doesn't he? He goes after us and brings us back. However, if we stubbornly, defiantly do those things that we know we shouldn't be doing, God says we shouldn't be doing, do not expect God to come after us. We will often have to suffer the consequences, and they may be very severe. But even after that, God is still in His mercy trying to get a hold of us, such as His love for us and His desire to get a hold of us. So, friends, to avoid veering off from the law, we need to keep our eyes upon Him, don't we? We need to keep our eyes upon Him. There's that wonderful verse in Hebrews 12 that says this, Hebrews 12 and the first couple of verses, uh, all very well known. Therefore, since we have so great a multitude of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance. We need to walk with God without encumbrances. There's so much baggage we can take with us sometimes, and we need to get rid of it. You know, I've come, I, I, I just, the, the, the people I meet in, in my own church, you know, carrying things, you know, not wouldn't let go of bitterness or of a grudge against somebody, or holding against somebody. Someone so and so did this, and I can't, you know. And, and, and we've got to let go of those things. These are encumbrances. They weigh us down. We won't be able to walk properly with God. We need to get rid of them. We need to not take offense quickly. That's part of being dead to self, you know. Part of being dead to self is I don't take offense when someone says something not very nice to me or about me. Oh, yes, it might hurt. But I don't take offense, and I don't try and get even. So we, let it, we, we, give it, we commit it to God, and I was just talking to a, a man in our church who was trying to get bitter about something, about something that happened with a particular family. Pray for them, I said. If you pray for them, your heart will change. You won't be bitter. Pray for God's goodness upon them, even though you may be in the right, brother. He wasn't, actually, mostly. But even if he was in the right... Pray. Pray for them. So if there's something in your heart like, towards somebody and it's not quite right, start praying for them. God will remove the encumbrance from you and you'll be able to walk with God. So go back to that verse. Lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles. Well, it goes without saying. We've got to get rid of sin from our lives. If this thing is in our lives that shouldn't be there, they're definitely going to stop us walking with God. We need to get rid of them. It's so easily done. Let us run with endurance 
the race that is set before us. So there's a race here. It's, 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 a, it's an endurance race. We're in a, this walk, if you like, this race, if you want to call it, is not a short sprint. It is something that is lifelong. And there are battles in our lives right until the day we, we go, to, go to be with the Lord. We'll be, we'll, be, we'll be battling things, battling pride all our lives. Pride is an ever-present enemy, isn't it, that wants to come in and, and raise itself and say, look at me, look what I've done. might not put it so explicitly, but, but it's there. These battles that are in our hearts and our lives, we need to overcome them, and we will, on an ongoing basis, now, yes, God might, relieve, might take some things right away from our hearts, and, and we don't have to battle with them. And I, I know this happens with some people when they become Christians. The Lord deals with swearing, for example. It gets rid of it completely. Others have to battle a bit longer about other, with other things. But we need to run with endurance. And God is the God who gives endurance. That's why we want to stay near Him, because all that we need to walk with Him is provided by Him. It isn't as if He's sort of by me and just cheering me on. He's actually actively involved in our lives, giving us the grace we need, giving us the endurance that we need. Oh, and boy, boy, oh boy, don't we need endurance sometimes? Don't we need endurance? So our eyes need to be on Him, carrying on, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Now, we can only fix our eyes on Jesus if we are near Him. If I'm distant from Him and walking in a completely different way that He'd have me go, how can I fix my eyes upon Him? We need to stay near Him. But praise God, it's easy to come back on track with the Lord because if we confess our sins, if we get right with God, we are back on track. God isn't one to just sort of dismiss us once we've made a mistake, praise God. I wouldn't be here this morning. But we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him, friends, who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Consider him. Consider him. So, friends, let's keep our eyes upon the one that we're walking with, upon the Lord Jesus Christ. So that when he slows down, we slow down. When he speeds up, we speed up. When he turns left, we'll turn left. When he goes a different route, we'll go with him. And of course, that's all to do with us growing in sensitivity spiritually with the Lord. Discerning in our spirits what the Lord is saying, what he's doing, where he's going. That comes, yes, through living, walking with him. And particularly getting into his word. But, you know, if we defiantly and stubbornly veer off, as I mentioned, then there's no guarantee that he will come after us. In fact, he will let us suffer the consequences. And there's several examples in Scripture I jotted down here. Uh, one of them is in Deuteronomy 1. When the people of Israel refused to go into the land first time, this is re they're recapping it in Deuteronomy. He's, Moses is telling the people, this is the, this is the record of what's happened the last 40 years. And the people of Israel refused to go into the land initially, even though jo uh, 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 Joshua and Caleb brought back a good report, the other ten brought back a bad report, and they refused to go in. And then the plague came, and the things happened, and then Moses told them that you know, they, they, they God was very grieved by this, and they said, okay, then we'll go. And Moses said to them, don't go. God is not with you anymore. God will not be with you when you go up there to that battle, and when you go and uh, forget the battle who, who, it was, who it was with, I get it right. I better turn there first of all. Um, Deuteronomy 1, and then he says, It's a great book, Deuteronomy. Lots of good things in there for us today. Um, do read the Old Testament, by the way. I hope you're not just in the New Testament, friends, to get a full orb view of God, to get a good understanding, a right, a full understanding of you need to be in the old and the new together. Um, where does it say, the Lord was angry with, angry with me, Moses, saying, on account of you, not, the, uh, not even you shall enter the promised land. Joshua shall go in. Uh, and so he gone. Then you said to me, we have sinned against the Lord. We will indeed go up and fight, just as the Lord our God commanded us. And every man of you girded on his weapons of war and, reg and regarded it as an easy thing to go up into the hill country. It's not easy, friends, to walk without God. We may think it is. The natural man might tell us it is. 
but there'll come a time when the natural man is not enough and he will be, he'll be shown to be what he is, woefully inadequate, woefully short of what God intends and wants for us. And then they said, oh, let's go up. It's easy to go up into the ill country. And the Lord said to me, say to them, do not go up nor fight, for I am not among you. In other words, the Lord wasn't going to go up there. If they were going to go up there and fight, God was not with them. They weren't walking up there with God. God was remaining back in the camp because God had been grieved and God was saying, I'm not going up there now with you. You have to suffer the consequences. And what did they do? Um, and the Lord said, say, say to them, do not go up to fight for I am not among you. Otherwise, you would be defeated before your enemies. So I spoke to you, but you would not listen. Oh, doesn't that speak of me so often? I'm sure it might speak to some of you. We don't listen. Well, we're slow to listen. We're slow to hear. So I spoke to you, but you would not listen. Instead, you rebelled against the command of the Lord and acted presumptuously. Presumption and pride go together. Presumptuously and went up into the hill country. The Amorites who lived there defeated you and you, 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 you fled. You returned and wept before the Lord, but the Lord did not listen to your voice. For those were tears, not of repentance and godly sorrow. They were tears because they'd, had to, they'd suffered loss. And so you remain. So, so there's an example of where if we are deliberately intending or going and doing our own thing, walking without God, God will not accompany us. God is not going to say, oh, I better go with him just to watch over him. God will actually say, well, you go and you suffer the consequences. You know, God may keep a measure of, of, of protection on us. I know that in my own life. Before I really committed myself to the law, the law watched over me. Thank you through, through the, prayer, the prayers of others. But the law can sometimes, as when I'm a Christian and I start veering off, the law will say, well, you suffer the consequences. Okay, because you're doing this and you know I've said you shouldn't be doing it. Another example is Jeremiah 42. Go and look at it for yourself. Uh, really, it's when um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the Ishmaelites, sorry, it was Ishmael who killed um, Gedaliah. They were, the Babylonians had taken them out of, out of, uh, of Israel, out of Jerusalem. They'd all gone to serve. So they left some in the land. And those who were left in the land, uh, one of the, Ishmael had killed the, the Babylonian soldiers who were watching over them. And the rest of them then feared for their lives. And they said to Jeremiah, look, Jeremiah, go and seek the Lord for us. We will do whatever God tells us to do. That was their own words. We will do whatever God says. God knows what's in our hearts. And God didn't speak to Jeremiah for 10 days. 10 days later, the word came to Jeremiah. And he said, tell them, do not go down to Egypt. Because they wanted to go to Egypt because it was safer there, they thought, because the Babylonians couldn't get them. Don't go down to Egypt, because there I won't be with you, and you will suffer. Well, by that time, in those 10 days, their hearts had hardened, and they had determined they were going to go down. They said, oh, Jeremiah, you're not speaking from the Lord. Uh, that's not God speaking. We're going to go anyway. And so they went, and of course, they suffered consequences, and none of them returned. And that's what Jeremiah told them. He said, if you go, God would say, none of you will return to this land, except a few fugitives it was. So, again, it's another example of when we determine to do our own thing and stop walking with God, there are consequences. There are consequences, and we have to live with the consequences. Sometimes they might even be lifelong consequences. Lifelong consequences. <clears throat> anyway, let's move on. Malachi 2, verse 6. This is the chapter we read this morning. Malachi 2, uh, verse 6. And it says this there. Um, verse 5, my covenant with Levi was one of life excuse me, and peace, and I gave them to him as an object of reverence. So he revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and unrighteousness was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many back from iniquity. So here we have to walk with God in uprightness and peace. The two go together again. The two in Scripture are so linked. Peace here, the Hebrew word is shalom. It's our well-being. And uprightness and well-being cannot be separated. If you walk unrighteously before God, you won't have a well-being. And that explains much of the mental health problems we have in the land. It's because people, not every, everything of course, but much of it is to do with the fact that we are living lives separate from our God, our Creator, our Savior. 
And this is what happens. But when we live righteously, there is a well-being God gives us. For us who are in Christ Jesus, God wants us to walk righteously with Him and have that well-being, and that will affect others. Other people will see this because it says there, they turn many back from iniquity. I know that was part of their service, but there was an effect. Their service was effective. If you want to have an effective Christian life, you have to walk with God. There is no effective Christian life walking separate to God, doing your own thing. There are many, and sadly, ministries, so-called, that seem to have lots of fruit, but actually there's no substance to them. I mean, I read a, 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 a thing recently. There was <clears throat> some American missionaries were in India. This is going back some time now. And supposedly thousands had made a commitment at their concerts or whatever. But when they went back a couple of years later, I think only one out of the thousand they could find was walking with God. There was no fruit because God was not in it. There's a lot of hype, a lot of this emotionalism maybe and all the rest. But unless God is there, unless the Holy Spirit is at work, it's ineffective. You see, Levi's ministry was effective. He walked with God in uprightness. And there was a shalom about his life that affected others. And so when he brought something of God's Word to others, when he served God in the way that he did, when we serve God in whatever God gives us to do, there will be an effectiveness about it when we are walking with God because God will be with us. There will be an influence God will be able to exert through us in the lives of others. And God's salvation purposes will be furthered. In fact, if we go back to Genesis, but we won't go back there. Enoch was the great-grandfather of Noah. Now, most of those men would have known each other. Abraham would have known um, Noah, believe it. I think, I think you know, certainly the son, I think Noah as well, because he lived 600 years after, I think, or quite a few years, three or 400 years after. But Enoch died young, actually. So Noah wouldn't have met Enoch, but he would have met Enoch's father, Enoch's son, and grandson. He was the great-grandson, because they all lived so long lives. And Noah was the next person we read that it says Noah walked with God. Go and read it in, in chapter 6. Noah walked with God. So in a sense, there was a, Enoch left something of a heritage behind him. He left something of an influence in his family line. Maybe his son and his grandson weren't walking as they should have been. We don't know. It doesn't say. It doesn't record that. But certainly Noah walked with God and was involved in the salvation purposes of God. God redeemed him and the whole family. God preached through Noah to others as well. Others were given the opportunity, but they rejected. But God saved Noah. Noah walked with God. So you see, Enoch's influence, I like to think, had a greater effect than just on those who lived with him in that generation. It was beyond that as well, because there were others that knew him. Noah might not have seen him, but he knew others that had seen him. And they were able to tell him what this man was like. He walked with God. And we need to walk, friends, in righteousness, in, in peace, with God. Walking with God, friends, is walking with a purpose. So many in our day have no purpose to their lives. And that so often does bring mental issues and other issues because they see it's pointless. And so we see people want to euthanize their lives. Uh, 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 you know, tragic that even in somewhere like Belgium and Holland now, young people can euthanize their lives because of problems that they've got, mental health problems. They can kill themselves legally. That's the sign of a decadent society. That's the sign of a society that really is on its last legs. And the West really is in a pitiful state. And God's judgment is beginning to fall upon us in the West. May God give grace to this country. To, he's brought us out of Europe. May he give us the grace now to, 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 to pull away from some of those things that we're involved in and still are involved in that grieve God so greatly. So walking with God is walking with a purpose. It is walking 
in life. There'll be a life about us that you won't see anywhere else. That's the intention of God. Now, I know, am I speaking for myself here? That's so often not the case. Things get on top of me. Circumstances can get press me down. And I can say, the life of the Lord isn't as evident as it should be. But God can overcome that. He can raise us above our circumstances, above the pain, above the suffering. <clears throat> and He can do something in us and through us uh, that we, we wouldn't otherwise be able to do. And it's so often in those times of difficulties, we want to walk closely with Him, don't we? That's the time we want to get close to Him. And that's the time He can so meet with us. So walking with God, friends, is walking in life. Enoch did not taste death. You and I will not taste death in the second deaths. The second death. We might taste the first death, the death of our physical beings, but our spirits will live on eternally and we'll be clothed in the new body one day. We won't taste that awful second death that Scripture speaks of. So Enoch is almost a, a, a picture of the new birth, if you like. He went straight to be with the Lord. And that's what you and I will do if we are loving the Lord and walking with Him and, and know Him. When you and I leave this earth, we will immediately go into His presence. What a wonderful thought that is. What a wonderful hope we have. Let's be ready to give a reason for the hope to others, as Peter tells us. Give the hope that is there within. Be ready to give that uh, an explanation for the hope with gentleness and respect as well, of course. Of course, if we're walking without God, we are walking so often in the futility of our minds. Again, another verse from Ephesians. When we walk separate to God, there's a futility to our lives. There's an emptiness. It says in Ephesians 4, verse 17, So this I say, affirm to you with the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind. So if Paul is saying that to the Ephesian Christians, there is a possibility that they could be doing it. God doesn't speak in hypothetical ways. He doesn't. So when we read Hebrews 6 about falling away, it is possible to fall away from the Lord. God doesn't speak hypothetically in Scripture, friends. He's not like you and me. When He says things, He means it. That you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God. When we walk separate to God, we're excluded from His life. The life and the power of God that He has for us to live for Him the power that the Spirit of God will give us is not available to us when we walk separate to God, when we're living our Christian lives separate to Him and just doing our own thing. No, we could say much more, but I haven't got time. But there are other ways. Go and look at these verses yourself. We, go, we need to walk by faith, not by sight. We need to walk in love. Ephesians 5. We need to walk by the Spirit. Galatians 6. Go meditate on those passages you said, but I just want to finish with this. The consequences of walking with God. And I've mentioned some of these already. We will have a direction to our lives. There will be a purpose to our lives, a direction to our lives. There will be an effectiveness about our lives. Even if it's in some small way, God will make us effective in whatever we're doing. There will be a hope that will shine out to others. There'll be an influence over others as well. Others will see. And we'll finish the race with a commendation. We won't just scrape into heaven by the skin of our teeth. We'll come and God will say, well done, good and faithful servant. I want that commendation, friends. Do you? I want that commendation. I don't want to just get into heaven by the skin of my teeth. I want the Lord to say, well done, good and faithful servant. There is constant companionship as well when we walk with God. Constant companion. He may feel as if he's not near sometimes, but we know he's one prayer away. We just need to call upon him. Companionship. And then, finally, there is a security that God gives us. There is a shielding of us. I just remind us, I was thinking about this today. Do you remember when Satan, uh, when, when Jesus said to Peter, Satan has requested permission 
to sift you. He had to get permission because Peter was walking with God. He wasn't perfect. We know that. He denied Jesus three times. He wasn't perfect. If you and I are in Christ, the enemy cannot do what he wants with us. Yes, if we are foolish and, and go into places and things that we shouldn't be doing, involved in things we shouldn't, then, then it gives him a foothold. It gives him a doorway, a way in. But when we are walking with God in righteousness and humility, there is a security where the enemy cannot touch us without the permission of God. Now, God may give him permission to sift us and to do a little bit of wobbling and, and shaking as he did to Job. Job was a righteous man walking with God. But God gave the enemy permission to do things which weren't, you know, we look at it and think, well, why did God do that? But when you go and read the last chapter of Job and see what God brought from his life, God restored everything to him. God increased him doubly, double. God gave him more sons and daughters. God is never any man's debtor. If you give to God, God will give double back to you. I should be careful what I say there. God can't guarantee that, but God will give you maybe more than double. But you see, there's a security with walking with God because the enemy will need permission to put a finger on you. And if he does get permission, you can guarantee there'll be a limit to it. God will set a limit and he'll give you the grace to come through it. So if you th feel you're going through the mill at the moment, keep walking with God. Keep looking to Him. Keep asking Him for the grace that you need. And He will give it. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we want to thank You this morning for the privilege beyond measure of being able to walk with God, to walk with our Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who saves us, the one who loves us, the one who has His best, our best interest at heart. Father, help us to walk with you in humility, in righteousness. Help us to know more of your life in us, more of your power at work in us. Oh, help us, Father, to, 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 to emanate that hope from within. That others will see and want to know why is it in a day of such darkness and a hopeless day that we're living, why have you got hope? It's because Jesus lives. And he is with me and I'm walking with him. Oh, give us the words for this, we pray. And we pray that for tonight as well, as some come through the door may not know you. Oh, God, speak to them. Show them that in a dark day there is hope, there is light. It's found in the Savior. Lord, give us the grace to show these things and to tell these things, we pray. Amen.